And I was kind of almost doing deals with God. If there was a God, I promise I'll be good. I'll be good. I'll be good from here on out if I can just land this, this fish. I promise. And from that, you know, I did a couple of different, you know, I, was, I produced artwork after I caught it. And then I killed it, you know, and I felt I didn't want to do it, but, but I wanted to do it. That was Ray Troll sharing a story of mixed emotions in relation to an early fish encounter. The most influential fish artist I know today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thank you for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you get a chance, uh, head over to wetflyswing.com slash fly shop and check out our local fly shop that we're supporting today, and you can support that fly shop as well. Today's episode is presented by Jackson Hole Fly Company. Jackson Hole Fly Company is a new kind of online fly shop. They design and manufacture their own high-quality fly rods, reels, gear, and over 1,000 fly patterns. Right now, you can get 25% off your first order. Go to jhflyco.com slash swing to get started today. That's jhflyco.com slash swing. Stonefly Nets is putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. When Ethan designs your net, it's his hope and goal to help you form a lasting memory every time on the water. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. Rachel, a man who has some of the most unique fish art, is here to share his story and how it all came to be. T-shirts and art like Spawn Till You Die, Fish Worship, and many, many others tell the story of a fascination with fish and fish art, and we get it all today. This is this is really a good one. If you don't know Ray, uh, you are in for a treat today. This is definitely a big one. So without further ado, here is Ray Troll. How's it going, Ray? It's going good, Dave. It's raining sideways here. How's it uh, doing down there? You know, it's actually not bad. It's it's overcast, and you know, like this time of year, that's not a bad day. It's not raining here, so that's kind of a win, I guess. Well, we have a hundred percent chance of rain today, and a hundred percent chance of rain tomorrow, and on and on it goes. I think in about two weeks we might see the sun. <laughs> so that's awesome. Well, we're gonna dig into for those that don't know you. We have a lot of people that you know obviously love fly fishing, and I, I there's probably some people out there that haven't heard of you. And you have some artwork that's pretty amazing. We've had a couple of artists on in the past that have done oh. some fish art, but your stuff is really unique. We're going to dig into what you do and, uh, um, and, and all that, but just take us back. Let's go back. Cause I don't know the story about how you, how this came to be. So has art always been in your life and tell us how you came to be getting the, you know, the spawn till you die, right? Like how did all that come to be? <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, it's a weird and uh, twisting path to get to spawn till you die. But, uh, uh, I was spawned in, uh, 19, uh, well, my parents spawned and I, I was born in 1954 <laughs> and, uh, I happened there, but I was born into an, an air force family. Dad was in the air force. He, um, flew in, uh, world war II. Uh, and then after the war, he, uh, settled down, had a bunch of kids and uh, I'm one of six kids. We moved every two or three years. And, uh, so that Air Force brat kind of lifestyle was always the new kid, always moving to the new spot, you know. But then uh, eventually, uh, you know, moved to Alaska uh, and uh, four of the six kids ended up living in Alaska. But uh, but yeah, art was my uh, lifelong passion. I, I learned early on that it was kind of my childhood superpower, you know, and uh, hmm. I was not really a sports kid. I was usually the last one picked on the team, but. My superpower was drawing, and uh, I re distinctly remember drawing dinosaurs when I was like four years old, and I'm 67, and I'm still drawing dinosaurs, and I started adding fish. And uh, but, but yeah, even in kindergarten, I began to see, you know, that I got kind of special treatment because I was the kid that could draw, and I remember that I uh, was hired uh, or directed by my kindergarten teacher. This is in Mobile, Alabama, when we were stationed in the base there. And, uh, I got to paint the uh, the set for the old lady who lived in the shoe. I got to paint the shoe. 
and uh, got out of class to do that. So I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. Wow. So anyways, yeah, I was, a family of six kids. I was always I was very happy drawing in the room, you know, yeah. making noises to myself. So that's really cool. So I know your art very well. I've got plenty of books and T-shirts and everything. But describe your art for somebody who's never seen it before. How would you describe it? Huh, I'd be curious to hear you describe it, but uh, <laughs> hmm. put that back on you. You describe it, then I'll tell you if you're right. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. I like that. <laughs> so I would describe it as. Um, I mean, I guess I've seen a lot of the fish. Obviously, I'd say it's kind of a. Um, it's like a paleo fish, uh, not wacky, but it's. Um, God, it's hard to describe. It is awful. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of wacky, but wacky is not the right word. It's kind of a. You know, there's true. There's a lot of validity, obviously, to the you know what you draw. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm not coming up with a good answer. But it does... <laughs> well, it's kind of a yeah. There's humor in my artwork. It's maybe insanely detailed. Kind of known for that. Mm -hmm. I geek out on um, you know what animals and creatures look like, but it's natural history artwork, but kind of twisted a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, I went to art school. I went to, I got an undergrad degree in uh, in art, and then I went and got a master of fine arts degree in, in art, and I dove deep into art, and art has always been, you know, my passion. It's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And But uh, once upon a time, somebody described my art as scientific surrealism. Mm. And I went, ah. Right. I guess that's what I do. So there's a little bit of... Uh, Kind of, I grew up in Mad Magazine, you know. Uh, uh huh. I got indoctrinated with Monty Python. Right. So it's absurd humor, but then there's something behind it. And you know, as I said, I grew up drawing dinosaurs, and so I was always in a natural history. So I have a lifelong fascination with the natural world, and um, but you know, everything changed for me when I was on this art path. But it really changed for me when I landed in Alaska and. Fish took over my life then, Dave. <laughs> oh, that's it. So Alaska was the big, and we've had a few guests. We just had um, Linda from Fishy Wear on. She has like women's uh, fishing clothing oh, yeah, and stuff. Cool stuff yeah. And, yeah, and she's up there. And uh, and but it's so cool because you hear all. And I've been to Alaska a few times, and it, it is an amazing place. But I'm always curious because it's a, an extreme place, right? I'm not sure where exactly. I think you're in Ketchikan, right? I catch a can where it rains uh, 13 feet in the average. And exactly. So tell me about what do you love about what do you love about Alaska? <laughs> well, uh, I just posted something uh, today on Facebook that uh, you have to be a real pluviophile to live in a place to live in a rainforest. And uh, pluviophile is somebody who loves rain. OK, there you go. Pluviophiliac. So you, you're pretty rainy down there, but. There's just something so inspiring about Alaska, and I think that's why, you know, uh, three of my siblings landed here, too. It's uh, It truly is inspirational. Not only is it uh, just the landscape is awe-inspiring, it's, um, yeah. it's a place that's alive. Uh, it's a place that's um, uh, rich in history. And it's kind of like I look at it as like it's what America used to be. You know, it's what the world used to be. It's almost like a, listen, the wilderness is such a special thing. Yeah. And um, I landed in the place to be my sister brought me up here. So it was a sibling thing. And uh, hmm. I, she brought me up here to be a fishmonger. So it's this whole fish culture that's here. And but what's cool about the place is that, you know, I am if I can walk two blocks up the hill, I'm in wilderness. Wilderness, you know, I mean, genuine wow. wilderness. It's like walking back into the Pleistocene. It's like the same landscape that's been there for 10,000 years. And if I walk two blocks down the hill, there is the ocean. And this is a little slim sliver of uh, civilization <laughs> that kind of runs along the coast here and the northwest coast. And and uh, the native culture is alive and, and thriving. And uh, I'm in the land of the uh -huh. uh, Clinket people, the traditional lands of the Clinket people. It's also the point where the Haida and the Simshian people, uh, all three uh, native nations kind of meet right here in Ketchikan. So it's just endlessly inspiring. But, but I, you know, I tumbled into the world of uh, fish and that's, and that's what inspiration. And I think um, as an artist, you're, you're attuned to being uh in touch with a sense of awe about things. And um, 
I fell in awe, I guess, if you will, <laughs> with yeah, with uh, with Alaska, fish, which is I think your your uh, all of your listeners have got the same uh, reverence for anything fishy. Yep. No, that's that you're hitting. Definitely, that's that's what it's about. You mentioned a little bit ago about uh, twisted, you know, in, in part of that description of your art. Uh, describe what you meant by that. Oh well, twisted. It's kind of dark. It's a weird, offbeat kind of sense of humor, and sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, uh, and that's where the surrealism comes in. Surrealism speaks to you on a different level. It's it seems absurd. It's sort of dreamlike. It's kind of uh, plays in the imagination. But um, you know, something. There's a T-shirt. Maybe you have it in your collection. Yeah. That I did. That's called Fish Worship. Oh, yeah. I don't have it, but I know it. Yeah, fish worship. Describe that one. Fish worship. Is it wrong? I literally dreamt that I had a kind of image in my brain when I woke up and it just I thought, well, that's funny. But I can't tell you why it's funny, really. It's like, yeah, but it's fish worship. Is it wrong? It's like, maybe I love these fish too much. Maybe is what it's saying. <laughs> but it's, uh, gotcha. it's an image of uh, fish. Uh, it's a trout. It's a, um, it's a rainbow trout. Uh, the sacred rainbow trout, also known as a steelhead, the seagoing version of mm -hmm. uh, rainbows. And there's a bunch of raised hands and there's electric bolts coming out of the fish. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, it speaks to you on this level that's it's not really rational. Right. It's uh, intuitive, I guess. But uh, that's awesome. So the, the, the image resonates with people if you're into this kind of fish culture that we inhabit, you know, exactly. Yeah, that in definitely, like you said, you're preaching to the choir here because we all, we all love fish. And uh, can I get an amen? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, amen, man. Come on down to the river. I love it because it's, uh, you, yeah, the fish. I totally know it, I, and I'll put a link. This is going to be a great one because the show notes of this episode are going to be filled with great uh, your art. We're going to steal some of the things we talk about and post them in our in the show notes. But um, yeah, I mean, you got so much. I don't even know where to start here. I was kind of thinking about on this, the the paleo. We got a book, and I, I'm trying, I can't remember the name of it, but my kids love it. You did a book that has like the whole history of kind of fish, right? I mean, you go way back. And can you talk about a little bit there? Because you not only talk about kind of contemporary stuff, but you talk a lot about uh, ancient fishes and things like that. Can you, if you know what book I'm talking about first, and then can you describe a little bit of the brief history of fish? Well, uh, there's a few books I've done. I've done actually like, 10 books now, uh, but one of them was Planted Ocean. That's it. And uh, it starts out on a steelhead stream, and it kind of ends back up in a steelhead stream. But I uh, did that with my buddy Brad Matson. He lives in Port Townsend, and uh, he and I were put together uh, by an editor. Uh, we did our first book called uh, Shocking Fish Tales, and uh, that was my very first book. It was came out in 1991. And uh, I approached an editor about doing a book. I, because I had this T-shirt line that was kind of thriving, and I had an audience for my T-shirts. And but I was trained as an artist, and you know, I and books are really important to me, and books are life-changing things. And I wanted to do a book, and so I I pitched the idea. I call I cold called a publisher, and said I want to do a book, and I got all this fish art and these photos of it, and I got a following, and so she put team me up with Brad Matson, and um, he wrote essays to kind of fit around my artwork. But we hit it off. We did a second book called Planted Ocean, Dancing to the Fossil Record. And that's where I kind of, because we, we were a great fit for each other. Uh, we loved working with each other. I was, you know, he was the the word guy and I was the image guy. And uh, we took photos and drew pictures. I drew the pictures. He told the story, but we went on a journey back to Kansas, where I'd gone to high school, a uh, road trip. And uh, on that trip, we kind of visited museums, went to fossil sites, and I was turning him onto my love of paleontology. Hmm. And uh, But it was fish that had brought us together. And uh, so we always had a fishy bent to anything that we were doing. We were always either going fishing or asking somebody about fish or we went to Kansas and went gar fishing, you know, for, mm, is there just nice. cool gars are so yeah. cool. And, and then we brought it back to the Northwest, but on that trip, we kind of dug deeper into the paleontology and well, just the history of life too. So it gets pretty kind of heavy, but you start seeing how there's all these connections in the natural world. And we understand 
you know, the average person gets evolution to a certain point. You can look at a monkey and get the relationship. You can look at an ape and easily see the relationship there. But not everybody takes it any deeper than that. Most folks don't. But when you go deeper into it, you kind of have you come to this weird and totally freaky kind of realization that we are fish. And that <laughs> you have made the journey, my friend. Wow. You have come to that level of understanding. And really, we're taught it in, in uh, junior high and high school, evolution. There was a fish that crawled up out of the land and... 375 million years ago, a group of fish that, you know, we are all descendants. And, you know, really, every creature with a backbone is a variation on fish, which is mind-blowing. <laughs> that is. Yeah, and there's basically two different kinds of fish in the ocean. And one has, uh, one group has uh, backbones made of cartilage, and they are vertebrate cousins, too. But those are the sharks and the ratfish. Mm -hmm. But then the bony fish, which this show is all about the bony fish, yep. are members of the ray finned fish group, uh, the Actinopterygians, I believe, if I use my polysyllabic Latin, but uh, the ray finned fish. But we, and those are our cousins, but we are, we other vertebrates, we terrestrial vertebrates, are descended from a group of fish within the bony fish group. Uh, called the lobe fin fish. Mm -hmm. And those lobe fin fish are fish that uh, there's only a couple of them left in the world today that are unmodified. And those are coelacanths and lungfish, which is, you know, here's a clue. If you actually hold a lungfish underwater, it will drown. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> uh, and those are fish that they're called lobe fins because their fins began to have a bony structure in them that was really like our arm. One big mm. bone and then two bones and then a bunch of little bones. And uh, coelacanths still actually have that kind of structure. So anyways, we know that we are, so all your, your uh, amphibians, your reptiles, your birds, your mammals, humans, primates, we all belong to the lobe fin descendants. Uh, but anyways, in the end, we're all encompassed within that that group. But anyway, so it's, it gets a little complicated sounding, but it's really pretty simple, you know? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. On that, on that journey with Brad, we also came across any cool fish that we wanted that, that we would geek out on. Uh, like I said, there were the gars, which are ancient fish, uh, go back to the days of the dinosaurs. They're kind of on a separate line. But, um, one of the things too, is we, we got to nerd out and I drug Brad down into this paleo fishing hole, if you will. We ran across the saber tooth salmon, which mm. is a very cool salmon. And uh, that's why you need to go see my exhibit at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. It's there through the end of the summer. Perfect. It's called uh, Cruising the Fossil Coastline. And in that exhibit, we have the finest example of the giant spike tooth salmon. We were originally calling it the saber tooth salmon, but I'm calling it the spike tooth salmon because Dave, this, huh. this is the best specimen of it in the world. Um, it was first dug up in Eastern Oregon. You're in Western wow. Oregon. Yep. It's about a 5 million year old salmon, but these freaking things are huge. So this is an actual salmon like related to a Chinook or something like that. Yes, I am not making this up. People, when I was, when I put it in the uh, Planet Ocean book, Brad and I wrote about it 20 years ago. Uh, but I've been, you know, obsessing on this fish for a long time. But it's the sister species of the sockeye, man. So that's amazing. Imagine the fillets in this thing. But what's so <laughs> weird about this, this fish, this giant salmon, easily reaching 400 pounds, eight feet long, maybe 10 feet long, and 500 pounds. I mean, that's marlin sized. Wow. But it's, it's a filter feeder. It's got twice as many gill rickers as a sockeye salmon. So these big spikes are on its snout. And the spikes are pointed sideways. You know what that's all about? That's crazy. No. It's for fighting and spawning, man. So they even take it. Well, yeah, exactly. The uh, changes in their morphology, right? Just like present day salmon. Exactly, man. So it's just incredible this change that salmon go through within a matter of weeks. 
you know, when they enter, they come back into the fresh water yep. after their ocean journey. It's all about sex and death, and uh, they're on that spot till you die, right? Spot till you die. Exactly, that's where it came from. It's that journey, <laughs> yeah, that journey to to uh, go to the the great uh, love party in the creek, and then you die. That's what's powerful. And I know you said this before on other shows, but that's what's powerful about what you do because you take you could tell the whole salmon life cycle, and you could talk about it, it could be really boring, or you could just say spawn till you die. <laughs> You know what I mean? And yeah. you, the way you do it resonates really well because, you, first of all, if you don't know what you're saying, you're like, well, what does that mean? And then you look into it and you're like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. Well, I guess that's what I try to do with my images so that I, I craft an image that maybe will – I try to craft an image that gets your attention and then there's something deeper there, I hope. But sometimes yeah. it's just a dumb joke too, you know what I mean? So Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. The CRC system from Trussell provides secure and convenient storage for your fully rigged fly rods. Every CRC system comes with secure mounting claps, padding in the reel compartment, and their proprietary suspended rod liners. Making it easier and faster to get on the water is a huge part, especially for me in this ever-increasing and busy world. Not only are the rods secure, but I know they're always rigged and ready to go. Help me get on the water and spend less time fiddling around with my stuff out there. Equipped with their padded and protective no snag reel up design, this is not your average rod carrier. Carrying your rods with reels facing up also means protecting your guides. Carrying your rods with the reels facing up means more protection for your guides, blank reel seat, and also allow for better fit if you have a hatchback vehicle. A ton of good stuff here, so I'm just going to let you go over and check out Trestle for yourself right now. You can do that at wetflyswing.com slash Trestle, and you can get started right now. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. You support this podcast by clicking over to check out Trestle right now. Okay, back to the show. So on your, and I'm thinking about some of your stuff, your book specifically at Planet Ocean. I mean, how much of that book is real, uh, legit? Is it all 100% like research you've done or is some of it kind of you play on stuff and make some stuff up along the way? Well, it's all legitimate, really, in the terms of like this, the things we talk about uh, are all real. They're in the fossil record. There's, Mm -hmm. then there's, you know, working with a a writer like Brad and a, a humorist like me, we... You know, take we, you, you try to extract meaning from it or jokes from it or you know, mm-hmm. so yeah. I mean that that is kind of the difficulty of the challenge for me, I guess, in that if I'm employing those things like you know weird offbeat humor or uh, you know dreamlike imagery, is what I'm doing real? But that's why I also obsess on trying to get you know, creatures portrayed and as accurately as I can, you know, so that mm-hmm. there's this sense, you know, that the creatures are real. Yeah. And, but, um, I'm posing some kind of, you know, question with it. But sometimes, like I said too, Dave is, it's just the sheer beauty of, you know, uh, I do these, I've done these massive murals too, that, um, there's no, there's no joking. There's no, uh, yeah, it's just, I'm geeking out on fish. Yeah. Where are those at? Well, I've got one, uh, uh, actually on my website, uh, there's a, there's a thing that's called a fish quiz. If you look in the, under the art, uh, the art section there, there, there's, a. have done, um, oh, like really three, well, uh, probably a, a dozen or so mural murals in my life. But, um, uh, like I've got a, a mural at the University of Alaska, Southeast in Juneau, and that's a, uh, it's a painting of, it's a big oil painting about uh, 14 feet long of salmon swimming into a forest. So that's kind of a surreal dreamlike image. But uh, when I went to the Amazon River for the first time in uh, 1997, I had a friend who said, man, if you're into fishing, and you love the diversity of fish, you have to go to the Amazon. And I went to the Amazon and oh my God, it blew my mind. And I came home and painted a mural for a year. Wow. But, um, of Amazonian fish and, uh, because the diversity there is just so stunning. But mm-hmm. I guess what I'm, I, the fish quiz is all about a, a mural that I did. It's at the university of Washington and it's called fishes of the Salish sea. 
And it was commissioned directly by the faculty at the University of Washington because I had been going to the, the UW fish collection. Your listeners may not know that there are these things called basically fish collections, but they're fish libraries, if you will. You can go and if you want to geek out and stare at a fish, they got them in, they got, you know, like a million specimens, uh, 40,000 in jars, and then there's larval fish. And so you can actually go to the fish library and ask to have an Ankarinkus nurka delivered to you and they yeah. bring it out. And just like a, a fine connoisseur, you can ask for bathy lickdops or a malacostius niger and fun to say those words and they'll bring them out and anyways so i did a, a, a mural uh that was commissioned by the faculty there and it's uh 10 feet by 14 feet ish and i just started painting from one end of the canvas to the other and um any fish that was in the puget sound area aka the salish sea i would go out to the studio uh, each day for about a year and just keep stacking fish in there. And I had an idea of where I, w I wanted to fill this canvas up and what it would look like, but I filled it with 112 different species. And I paint a species or two. I'd be lucky to get one done in a day, you know, start and finish one. But I grouped all the salmon together and uh, all the trout, which are technically wow. Pacific salmon. That's a lot. Following uh, a king of the salmon, which is a kind of uh, ribbon fish. And there's uh, native legends, uh, native peoples, the Macaw people believe that the king of the salmon was this weird fish that led the uh, salmon back to their home streams. And anyways, that's all painted in there. It's at the University of Washington. And then uh, a few years back, a friend of mine and I, Tom Grauman, who's down in the San Juan Islands, Sam's, uh, uh, Tom is a programmer, and we made a into an interactive quiz. So you can look at this and quiz yourself to see how many fish you can name. Oh, that's cool. So that's the quiz. So they can go on right now and, yeah, take the quiz. You can go on right now and you can quiz yourself, see how you're doing. And then at the end, if you get 90% uh, or above, you get to print out, honorary ichthyologist degree <laughs> nice nice there you go and then if you're super nerdy you could take the latin level test this is cool i'll get a link in the show notes to that for sure so people could take the quiz this is great i love this so you talked about the lobe fin how we came from the lobe fin fishes and i think the book the planet ocean kind of walks you through the different eras can you talk a little about just to give us again go back in time and give us a little short snippet on, I don't know if you go back to the dinosaurs or whenever, just a little bit of that brief history on the evolution of, of uh, whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's a big topic, so I, I don't want to like dig into it all, but a high level, <laughs> high level, like uh, my kids love the dinosaurs, you know, they love all that stuff. So, well, I guess uh, speaking to other fisher, fisher folks that listen to this, you know, uh, yeah, we did just have somebody on our podcast, Paleo Nerds, talking about the entire history of life. Oh, wow. Uh, he just wrote a book. He's a uh, Henry G is the uh, editor of uh, Nature magazine. And then he just wrote a book called uh, The History of Life in 12 Pithy Chapters. So Perfect. chapters is the entire history of the world, uh, how it came to be. But just to get back to, you know, our fishy origins, um, we are variations on a backbone creature. Uh, and where do the backbone creatures come from? Which is kind of a mind blowing thing. We go back and we, if you go back far enough in time, we are, we are related to starfish. They're the closest group to us, sea stars, and echinoderms, you know, so things like sea wow. cucumbers. And mm -hmm. weirdly enough, they're kind of our closest, um, uh, phyla that we belong with that we're next to, but that is weird. It's a weird thing, but we are basically the spawn of sea squirts. Hmm. You know what a sea squirt is? No, describe it. It's out there next to the sea stars and the and the cucumbers and all that, right? Yeah. So it's uh, oh, this is where the artist who's trying to be a scientist, <laughs> so yeah, explains it. But uh, the chordates, uh, there's there's these sort of almost chordates, in other words, those with backbones. And uh, sea squirts uh, just look like a little balloon or something attached to the sea bottom. And uh, there's oh, yeah. kind of a little hole in them. They look like a sponge. But 
their spawn, so getting back to spawning, when they in their larval stage, they spew out little eggs or whatever. They look like they're kids. So when their kids go out looking for a home, uh, they have their larval stage has a little hint of a backbone. Hmm. And so that shows that they're we're related to them on some level because that little hint of a backbone later did become a backbone. So if we go all the way back to the Cambrian age, so which is uh, when a lot of stuff shows up in the fossil record. So that's 500 million years ago, roughly. Half a billion years ago, there's little creatures that kind of look like the the spawn of sea squirts, but yet they've got that that backbone and the beginning of a backbone, and then that luckily through all the catastrophes that have happened on the planet, that little creature gave rise to another little creature, gave rise to another little creature that hmm. survived all these mass extinction events. And fish really do show up, something that could more or less be called a fish because it's got a head and a tail, a mouth and an anus, and kind of little proto fins that are starting to happen. Sort of by the end of the Cambrian, you got something that looks kind of like a fish. And then when you get into the later ages, there's the um, uh, Silurian, Ordovician, then there's the Devonian. That's 300 and, uh, about 370 million years ago is the uh, Devonian age. And that's frequently called the age of fish because fish are now in the ocean. Fish of every kind and flavor are all out there in the ocean and the sharks are flourishing and the, our lobe fin ancestors are filling up the ocean too. There's just lots of lobe fin fish, all kinds of variations on them. There's armored fish. So it's called the age of fishes, but there was one group of those lobe fin fishes that began to live in these kind of swampy areas uh, of the planet. And that transition onto land, they began to be more at home, kind of in that little world between, you know, on the riverbeds, if you will. Yeah. And began to, as a survival strategy, not that there was actually a strategy, but as it happened, began to breathe air and began to crawl up onto land. And that is, that's the big switch right there. The, one of the major events in the entire history of planet of the planet, at least with us backbone creatures is when our fishy ancestors left the water. And, um, so what's been cool since I've done the show with uh, the book with, with Brad, mm -hmm is those links between the amphibians and the fish. So the missing links, as people like to think of it, yep. in that last, in the last 30 years, we have narrowed that, I should say we, or scientists have narrowed it down uh, to the likely suspects and it's gotten much and much more likely. So basically it's a fish that looks like an amphibian, but yet it's a fish because it's still got the fins, but just one step away see where those fins become fingers so it looks like fish now we're evolving fingers and legs in the water before they left the water right just kind of mind-blowing but and it's uh, an animal that's called uh, elpistostege and then before that there's a one link out a little farther there was a fish called tiktotic and then when Brad and I were doing the book, it was a fish called um, Eustonopterum was as close as we had gotten to our fishy ancestors. But now we pretty much know that this fish, Elpistostege, which is found in the Devonian rocks of Canada, is pretty much looks like, a, you know, a salamander almost. Really? Yeah. Uh, that's cool. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautifully weird looking creature and weird is what I love, man. And <laughs> how weird to be thinking as you're sitting there fishing, when you're out there casting that fly, you're not catching lobe fin fish. You're cutting, you know, the ray fins stayed back in the water. Yeah. So that's the difference. So the trout and the salmon, that group, and the, you know, your bone fish, uh, all basically the, you know, there's 25,000 plus species of fish in the world and 25,000 species are, you know, in, in the water. And then the, the other 25,000 species of vertebrates, which are basically fish, 
when we were talking to Henry G uh, the other day in our podcast, he was joking around that the other 25,000 species of vertebrates are fish living in water of negative depth. So in other words, we are fish out of water, literally. Right. And so is your dog. So is. Yeah. We're all fish out of water. But, but hey, man, I love fishing. So. That's right. No, this is good. I think we could dig into it as deep as we want. I, I'm curious, <laughs> where would you send somebody, if, if they wanted to go deeper on this and really dig into the evolution and some stuff that, you know, we're not going to talk about, where would you send somebody? Where would you go? Well, go to, uh, you can dig around on my website, but on our podcast, uh, yeah, paleo nerds. You know, it's kind of shameful to be on a podcast talking about another podcast, but I love it. No, no, it's perfect. <laughs> but I'll talk about your podcast on my podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the number one way to grow your podcast. <laughs> paleo nerds. Uh, but we've had some of those researchers on. We've had two um, researchers that specialized in that uh, the bony fish. Um, Ancestry, the lobe fin fish. We've had uh, Dr. Neil Shubin on. We had an episode with him. And uh, Neil Shubin wrote a book called Your Inner Fish. That's a wonderful book. And that's really all about Tiktaalik. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as you publish a book, it's almost outdated because along that one's all about Tiktaalik. But then a couple of years ago, the papers all came out on El Pisto Stege. And um, there's an Australian fellow that actually led the research on that. He's yet to do a book on it, but his name is John Long. And uh, John's got various books on uh, the rise of fishes, and he helps you sort it all out. He's an Australian paleo ichthyologist, but an all around cool guy. And we've had him on the show too, just talking about how we are fish. That's cool. So you were talking a lot about evolution here and things like that, but uh, thinking about you, you know, you came to Alaska the first time you get there and you've been there for like 30, right? 30 or 40 years now? I'm coming up on 40 years almost. Next year will be 40. Yeah. Yeah, 40 years. So that's a, a nice chunk of time. How has your, you know, your art, so you started, the fish kind of took off. How has your, your own art evolved over time or has it been kind of similar if you go back 30 years? Well, almost 40. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They're 40. <laughs> 1983. Well, I came up here to be a fishmonger. Like some, my, uh, my... What is a fishmonger? Oh, well, one who mongs fish, man. Um, <laughs> but mongs. A fish. So a fishmonger is somebody who sells fish. I came up here to sell fish. Oh, to sell fish? Oh, right. Yeah. So so hop in, like boats, you're in the you're in catch can, right? you got tons of boats coming with fish and you sell fish. Uh, yeah. And my sister Kate had uh, been living here in Ketchikan before me and I was fresh out of art school. Didn't have anything going on. You know, what, a, what was I going to do with my master of fine arts degree? And, uh, three of my siblings already lived in Alaska. So she invited me up to spend a summer selling fish on the dock. And weirdly enough, a, a Ketchikan prides itself on being the salmon capital of the world. Oh, I you know, know that. to say we are the salmon capital. So she invites me up to the salmon capital of the world, but it's weird that the salmon capital doesn't have a fish uh, store. You can't go buy a fish. Oh, wow. So she wanted to fill that niche, and she started a little, uh, she and her husband, Bill Hansen, uh, started a uh, little fish store down on the dock selling fish to the locals and to the tourists. And I had a printmaking degree, so this is kind of how it all converged. So I knew how to print. I knew how to make a T-shirt. I knew how to do a, you know, wood blocks and that kind of thing and serographs. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to silk screen. But I came up to sell fish. But I landed in the middle of this fish culture without really being aware of this fish culture. This fish culture that was, I mean, there's there's a huge economy around fish mm -hmm. that I just really didn't have a clue about. Um, you know. Uh, I kind of had begun to get a clue about it. You know, when I'd lived in Seattle for a few years, you know. But uh, when you land here in Ketchikan, it's, you know, kind of ground zero for that. And uh, you realize, I came to realize as I was down there on the docks that there was this world of, you know, sports fishing. And then there was commercial fishing. And I didn't know all these, you know, nuances of it. You know, commercial mm -hmm. fishing, sports fishing, what did that mean? And with the gear types of sports fishing, you know, what, um, trolling, bottom fishing, there's all these things you got to learn. Yeah. You know, it's just a, 
it's delightfully overwhelming. I didn't mind, but I didn't know a humpy from a hole in the ground. And I had to sell yeah. fish. So I was going down and buying fish at the seafood plant, the processors, and bringing it down and putting it on ice and selling it to people and canned salmon. But I'm a curious creature and, uh, you know, inspired by things. And I began to really be inspired by fish. And then I also had the opportunity to, you know, really go sports fishing for the first time in my life and all the things that that involves, you know, and I was just, I'd gone to school in Kansas, you know, uh, my right. school in Kansas, never really been fishing. I'd been carp fishing and, you know, and I uh-huh. caught bluegills as a kid, you know, with sure. my grandpa in New York, you know, upstate New York. But now here I was in the land of fish and I was selling the fish and, but there was these fisheries biologists and fisheries managers and cannery workers. I was just, you know, in this world of fish and, uh, but it all changed, man, when I got to go fishing and it's so freaking exciting. Yeah. And then all the issues that come up when you catch a fish, you know, and like I said, being a curious person, I wanted to know more and more about you know, what I was catching, but my, the subjects. Yeah. So I just started diving deeper into the subjects and I began to realize that when I caught a rock fish, you know, mm-hmm. I've caught this one type of fish and it's different than the salmon. And, Oh, what is that about? And I get to realize, you know, if you release the a rock fish, it didn't live, right. It right. was floated at right. the surface and, Oh, that fish lives its entire life in one spot. And I just, you know, it's a curious thing. If I keep going back to that one spot and fishing that same spot, after a while, there's not as many rockfish. Hmm, why is that? Oh, they don't mature until they're 20 years old. Some of them live to be 100 years old. Wow. Some live to be 120. Crazy. Others in the same group live to be 200 years old. With over 40 years of experience in coffee, the Anglers Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind. And Joe's goal is delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. And I have no doubt that he is doing this. If you haven't checked out Anglers, you can do that right now. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness, For me, it's all about that freshness and taste. Opening up a bag of anglers in the morning is the way I start my day and the way you should as well. The Artist Series uh, provides $1 uh, back for casting recovery. And I recently uh, purchased a few bags of the Artist Series. This is Derek DeYoung, who we also had uh, on the podcast a while back. And he's got some cool, there's a cutthroat blend there you can check out and So it's a good way to give back to Casting for Recovery, give back to anglers, and this podcast all in one shot. They've got a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go option, and the roast sampler and all sorts of good stuff. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes we love. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now and check out greatness and freshness today. That's anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S. Check it out. Okay, back to the show. Well, if you look at your, so, and you've been doing, I'm not sure how many, you know, obviously you've got lots of art out there, but if you take one, something you're working on now, you compare it to something from say 30 years ago when you were in Alaska, how would they look differently? Well, they'd be a lot more accurate. And that is one thing when you're not here, like I said, I didn't really know a humpy from the hole in the ground. So if you look at my work from like 1984 or 1983, you'll see that my fish are kind of more the kind of the idea of a fish or the symbol of a fish. They might have big goofy lips or they might have an extra fin or two or, you know, uh, heaven forbid, you might see that the adipose fin on one of my early salmon has uh, fin rays in it. You know, how embarrassing is that? So, uh, so I began to, you know, have exhibits with my artwork. And if a biologist showed up and said, you know, you've got too many fin rays on that that rockfish, that was really embarrassing for me. You know? So I wanted to make it much more accurate. And I began to just really, del- and also 
the knowledge that you gain by actually interacting with your subject. In other words, I was selling fish, but also when I began to catch the fish, reel them in and see the like the color change it would go through. If you killed the fish, it like lost all its color. What's up with that? You kill a rockfish and it goes a yellow eyed rockfish. It turns white in front of your eyes. You catch a beautiful king salmon and, uh, you know, it's got this iridescent kind of lavender glow right above the lateral line. And uh, that's unmistakably a king salmon. I began to just revel in those details. And I began to, you know, every time I caught a fish or if I, I actually had a studio at it at the seafood plant, I would go down and photograph the fish and lay them out, you know, kind of clean. I have all my fish ID books, but I began to realize that the fish ID books were like only good for so much. And so I began to photograph them, but also, you know, just catching them and uh, looking at them and experiencing that, that moment, uh, you know, really, I will never, ever, ever forget the first time I caught a salmon. Uh, and it was weird because it's like the fish God spoke to me or something because my first king salmon was 41 pounds, 41 pounds. And I'd been fishing for five minutes with a friend. He took me out in his boat. I'm always very respectful with, with anybody with a boat because there's such a challenge to maintain. And uh, he took me out in his, in his skiff. It was an open skiff. And um, I can remember it like it was almost yesterday, really. You know, and I'm looking at the island and the north end of this island, the Gravina Island right across the way here from me. In the north end of that island, there's a, a point that's called Valinar Point. And the sun was going down. I think he, he was a school teacher. So we were there after school after he'd gotten out of school. So the sun was going down and we're trolling. I didn't know what that was. So John Dickinson, was my friend's name, the teacher, and he set me up. Uh, I think it was uh, a whole herring that we were using and we were trolling. He set it up for me. And uh, five minutes into it, my line went zinging. Zzz, and Ray, that's yours. Ah! So I grabbed the pole and he kind of coached me and I fought that fish for like 45 minutes, but I'll never forget when it jumped out of the water as I was reeling it in as like, Oh my God, it's huge. And it was coming for the boat, but then it would gain on me. And just that tug, that tugging back and forth, that electric feeling is something on the other end of your line. And, and then I just, I do just think, remember just going, oh, I just don't want to screw this up. I just don't, I got to do this right. I got to bring this fish close. And, and I was kind of almost doing deals with God. If there was a God, huh. right? I promise I'll be good. I'll be good. <laughs> yep. I'll be good from here on out. If I can just land this fish, I promise. Amazing. And from that, you know, I did a couple of different, you know, I, was, I produced artwork after I caught it. And then I, I, killed it you know and i felt i had all these mixed feelings about killing right and yeah i didn't want to do it but but i wanted to do it you know so i was right man you know, it was like the thing you had to do i had to like you know man up or whatever and grab man. gaff hook and clobber it and i felt bad to watch the life pour out of this creature and it's you know but then it was also primal it's like we're gonna eat so, and it was absolutely delicious. Yeah. And I felt guilty and I felt, so actually, I mean, that's where that tension, you know, is where good, where the inspiration was coming from. That's where, that's where good art, that's where drama comes from. You know, and so yeah. I, I, I drew a picture of it, of, of myself waking up in the middle of the night and there was that salmon and a rockfish hovering above the bed, haunting me. And I just wrote across the bottom of it, the spirits of all the fish I've ever caught come back to haunt me. And, uh, huh. that is true. <laughs> Cause wow. Where can we find that? Can we see that anywhere? Well, that was a t-shirt that I did and, uh, not all the t-shirts still around. It's on my website from, uh, if you go oh, good. into the archives. Okay. We'll track it down. I want to take a look at that. Spirits of all the fish I've ever caught come back to haunt me. And why? Why did you do this to me? Exactly. I'm your vertebrate cousin. 
Yeah. No, and you talked about Native Americans uh, at the start, and I think that, you know, the way they do things, I think, is a, it sheds light on, you know, uh, appreciating more of, you know, right, taking a, a little piece of the natural world or, or an animal. That resonates with me because deer hunting, I, you know, I've killed a lot of fish too, but I, you know, deer hunting, whenever I'm out there deer hunting and I get down and I, you know, and I've shot quite a few deer now last, you know, and it never changes me. I, you know, I mean, it, I'd always have the same feeling. I'm like, whoa, I get there. I'm like, man, this is, yeah. this is a, a life. This is a life. I just took a, a, a mammal and, uh, it's powerful. And I'm sitting there, I got blood all over my hands and I got my hand in it, you know, it's crazy. If you become insensitive to it, you become inhuman, I think, you know? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's always one of those weird things. And I always say my dad, I started hunting because of my dad, and I probably wouldn't be a hunter if it wasn't for my dad. And But I love that I am a hunter. You know what I mean? I love the fact that I have that thing to do for, and I don't even, can't even explain it really, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's that uh, you've got to have that respect, you know, for the creature, uh, for actually not just for the creature. I mean, to call the creature is kind of demeaning it, you know, in a way. Mm-hmm. Well, the fellow, the fellow animal. We're animals. Yeah, that is uh, Ray. That was I love that uh, you went down that road because that was pretty powerful. Um, you know, I don't want to miss the podcasting because you've mentioned the paleo nerds. I, I want to just hit on that briefly uh, because obviously I'm a huge podcaster and I love talking about podcasting. But tell us why you started that podcast because I know you've been on a few shows, but you've got almost fifty episodes, right? Uh, yeah, we've uh, wrapped up 52 and, uh, I was just thinking this morning, you know, I, I kind of want to do some more now, you know, and, and then you, then you reminded me with your email. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I'm doing one. Well, you're at that place, you know, yeah. you're, I've, I've helped a lot of people get into podcasting as well. And you're at that place. They say, once you hit 50, you know, well, you're already past the no turning back, but you know, you got to get to a hundred then, <laughs> then you're like, then you're there. Then it's like two years. Well, it's just fast. Because it's like I could read a book and finish the book and then call the, you know, email the author and have them on the show and ask him, well, what do you mean by that? Exactly. And, uh, it's like this, and now they're, you know, publishers are starting to send me books because they want to you know, yep. show and we've got to follow. They want you got to show. And the same thing for me, you know, Ray, this is like having you on the show here is I was going to ask you, I was kind of thinking about this, you know, do you, when you were a kid, did you ever want to be a rock star? Of course. <laughs> there you go. We all did. I was a teenager, man. I'm in a band too, you know. I got to put in a plug for my band. So you kind of are a rock. Well, you are a rock star in the in the fish art. Um, well, I'm 67 now, and I I do believe that everybody should be in a band, Dave. It's a good thing. And I, uh, yep. I, the Ratfish Wranglers is the name of my band. I was going to say we wrote a song. Or I, I should say I wrote a song. The band <clears throat> backs me up on it, but I did, wrote a song called Fish Worship, which explains it all. Fish Worship is it wrong? I met a guy today, okay. you know. Quack. Oh, wow. I didn't have much to say. Then the guy looked me straight in the eye. And the guy started to cry. He said, fish worship. Anyways. Wow. Uh, becoming obsessed with fish worship. Fish worship. But Where do we find Can we find that on uh, anywhere out there on your website or Spotify or something? It's on Spotify. Oh, wow. Spotify. Look at that. Now I'm debating Amazing. that I should join Neil Young. And you asked me about how the podcast came to be. And, and funny enough, it was a ventriloquist. Uh, who approached me about doing a, a podcast and he was moving his lips at the time. Uh, but, uh, I have a friend, um, uh, David Strassman is his name. He's actually a household name in Australia. He lives down in the Los Angeles area, Southern California, but, uh, he is a household name in Australia and he's a ventriloquist and uh, every Australian, every, uh, decent Australian knows his characters teddy bear which is this lovely little teddy bear and um the other one is uh chuck wood who's this snarky sort of evil puppet but uh dave has established an audience down there and he uh with the pandemic he couldn't go on tour anymore so he's been waiting and he's also kind of a paleo nut and um, we always talk fossils whenever he comes to town he has he had a house here in ketchikan and uh, he just called me up and said, "Hey, let's do let's do a podcast on you know together." He was kind of itching to do a show of some sort. So we have uh, been he we, he's and he's very much a recording kind of freak too, and microphones and getting everything right. And uh, uh, so it kind of grew into a bigger thing. And uh, my daughter was uh, our social media manager for a bit, so we got a following and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. There you go. 
and you do the art for the cover art, right? Yeah, and we have an insanely detailed um, uh, web page for every guest we have and special art, so it's a little. And we're we're not we're just doing it for love, man. We got no sponsors. We don't want any sponsors. No strings attached. No, that's great. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to take a break for a sponsor right now, but uh, yeah, we do we do have some sponsors, but uh, they're all they're all amazing companies. Like I said, they're all great fishy type companies, but. Um, you know, this is really cool because the podcast, so I mean, and you guys are going in, so the next, say, year, you're going to you're gonna be producing some more episodes? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a, a four more to go, and like I said, I've been itching to do some more because there's just so many, and, you know, I want to stretch it a little bit, you know, because I want to talk about other things other than paleo, just like maybe you're, when you asked me on, Dave, I was like, you're the, the you know, fly fishing show, I I've only attempted fly fishing a few times in my life, and there you go. I'm lousy at it. Well, that's more than 99% of the people in the world. <laughs> well, it is an art that you know I I aspire to, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I have great respect for, it, but you know, I maybe not patient enough for it or something. But I'm too much of a biologist and or artist to uh, to really do that, I guess. But yeah, well, part of it's the pain. I think when I ask people, I've had some of the you know big names in fly fishing, and I and I sometimes ask them like, "What was your evolution like to get to where you are as one of the great fly fishermen or women?" And they always say they started in gear fishing, and it feels like almost like people want more pain, you know, because it's harder to catch fish a lot of times with a fly. I so it's almost right. I no, I quickly realized that, dude. <laughs> that was yeah, that's it. Wait, this steelhead fishing is kind of about punishment, and uh, oh, yeah. you know, I, I was raised Catholic, so I've already got enough punishment and guilt in my yeah. life, and <laughs> but uh, recovering Catholic, as it were. But uh, no, I respect it, and I have done journeys up the great. We have some just incredible steelhead streams up here, and my next door neighbor has talked about your podcast and other podcasts all about mm. fly fishing. My next door neighbor cool. for about 20 years was the most avid fly fisherman in the world. And he was the one who uh, took me out and, and actually got a steelhead on my fly with him. Oh, wow. wow. And uh, took the photo of me with my one and only fly caught steelhead. And uh, so I had all the bragging rights, but I, I had to suffer for it. We were out there in the rain and the actually I gotta say I've caught two steelhead now on flies. I just flashed on that. That's cool. Because I, I knew that you know I was doing these fly fishing t-shirts and I've done them, you know. Oh uh, yeah. I've done a few and um time's fun when you're having flies. You know, <laughs> was a great pun that I always loved, and I and I uh -huh. just studied up on flies and hung out with a bunch of fly fishermen and I went on a fly fishing trip with a friend of mine, Bill Huntington, who was my mentor. And he taught me that steelhead was like the number one quarry in the fly fishing world. And they were the most dynamic, most awesome fish. Yeah. And um, so as usual, I got in, I, I get on the topics and I went way deep into this topic of steelhead and and I was delighted to find the scientist who changed the name from Salmo Gardneri oh, yeah. to Oncorhynchus micus and made them a Pacific salmon. And actually, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to, to Jerry Smith, who's one of the greatest uh, paleo ichthyologists out there. And he is uh, at the University of Michigan. And uh, he is the one who changed... Who, and we did an episode with him, and you might consider it too, Dave, as he mm -hmm. is the guy who was responsible for, he changed trout into salmon. Oh, wow. So your West Coast trout, you know, uh, your rainbow trout and your cutthroat trout yep. and your you know steelhead trout, they are salmon. They are in the same genus. They are salmon. That's right. So we need to stop calling rainbows trout because it's it's that difficulty between scientific, you know, the scientific name for something. But yeah, but I think if you learn the scientific names. It begins to you begin to see the connections between things and you understand that that steelhead and rainbows are in the same group. And, they're, and so are uh, cutthroat. They're all variations on Pacific salmon. Exactly. Yeah, that's the amazing thing is that they're literally 
yeah, I mean, Salmonid, you know, Salmonid, Salmonidae, you know, they're all in that family. And then the the cool thing is steelhead are literally the same species. I mean, my kiss. Well, the like, same genus, same genus. So yeah, you, yeah. you begin to learn that on Carincus. So when they're in that same, it's like variations on family members, right? But then. Yep. That's cool. Well, uh, so Ray, I'm going to let you get out of here uh, pretty quick. I just uh, was just thinking, looking ahead and, you know, I kind of always look ahead on things. So you got the podcast going, anything else kind of in the next, uh, you know, year you're looking at doing, or are you, are you just going to keep producing more art? Yeah, I'm going to keep uh, making art till they they pry the Crayola out of my hands, my fingers there. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. The uh, well, the biggest thing is you know, I've got this uh, traveling exhibit. Uh, it's going on down the coast, and uh, uh-huh. it is the Oregon Coast Aquarium. And Dave, you must drive down to see it at the Oregon Coast. Oh, Aquarium. I'm there. We might go there this weekend. Uh, you will see the spike tooth salmon fossil there. That's totally mind blowing. But I'm also working on a line of uh, fabrics right now. Uh, I want to do a line of uh, textiles and make some groovy button-up shirts so that you can have maybe that salmon, that button-up oh, nice. salmon dress shirt, you know, that you've like always that. had Ray Troll. So I like I've been that. stacking those up. I've got a few exhibits in the works, um, and uh, maybe I've got another book coming, too. It looks like I've got a publisher for my next body of uh, – fishy t-shirt art um uh-huh. i'm doing that with clover press down in uh, southern california and uh it's called fish head so you heard it here first actually i'm there you go debuting that for you it's called fish heads gonna be from clover press which always i always confuse that with clover pass which is a great fishing hole right up here in ketchikan clover pass oh, okay one of the most famous uh, salmon fishing spots up here. But, huh. yeah, Clover Press is doing that. So, anyway, well, thanks for having me on your show. And um, let me know when it drops. And I will share it on my social media and uh, Facebook and Instagram and all that. Sounds odd. Wait, wait, remind me again, when is that uh, project going to be out? Uh, we're looking at having it out by Christmas, the uh, new book. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Great Christmas. Cool. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get this thing out. Yeah, let's work targeting. So, if all goes well, knock on wood. Yeah, this is awesome. All right, Ray. Well, hey, thanks for the time today. This has been awesome. Uh, trollart.com will send everybody out to, and it's been a real fun catching up with you after all these years of, uh, you know, wearing your shirts and reading your books and stuff like that. So, I'm, I'm excited to share this with some people that haven't heard about you as well. So, thanks again. Yeah, and I look forward to meeting you someday, and uh, let's go fishing, man. So, there you go. If you want to find all of the show notes and everything else, you can go right now to wetflyswing.com slash 299, 299. We are one away, one away from the big one, another, another centennial, uh, 300. And we got a show, a good show for you on 300. This one, if you don't know, uh, this year we had a really amazing person who passed away and I, I'm doing a little bit of a celebration of his life. Uh, if you don't know Frank Moore, or if you do know Frank, um, we had him on the podcast a while back, and I am going to be re-releasing that episode. So if you haven't checked that one out or didn't hear that one, we're going to go uh, listen to that one again. And, uh, and for those that didn't the first time, I'm going to finish it there because I guess I'm having trouble with words. Uh, uh, Frank was a uh, pretty influential person not only in fishing and and steelhead and conservation a lot of things but just kind of an amazing person all around so but uh, i want to do my best to celebrate frank so check it out next week and share it if you get a chance and let people uh celebrate this man's life okay i'm gonna get back to it and you have a good week good night wherever you are and i will talk to you soon thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.